My name is Michael Curtis, and um, I've been here for quite some time. I spent a long time here, and then I was gone for a while, and then I come back again. And uh, that, I don't know what that says. I don't know what that says about me or what that says about the institution, but um, we, my wife and I found ourselves back in the area. Um, I've served three churches in my lifetime. One of them was in uh, Denver, Colorado, Southeast Christian Church. And then I served Parkview Christian Church um, here in Centralia. And then I served with Bethel Christian Church that's um, up in the Northeast. And it's been my privilege to be able to be used by God in those areas. And it's also been my privilege and my joy to be able to teach at Central Christian College of the Bible. My primary responsibility of teaching here is in the context of missions but it doesn't take me very long, and I run into about two or three other courses almost every semester that I end up teaching. Some of those are New Testament courses, and some of those are ministry courses. <clears throat> Periodically, I'll end up finding myself teaching a philosophy course or something like that called Worldviews and Ethics. And uh, so it's a, they, they, they kind of give me a lot of varying you know, courses to teach, which I'm always pleased to be able to, to do that. What we're going to do this afternoon, as we spend some time together, is we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. That ought not surprise you that you come here and I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to talk about Jesus Christ in the context that Jesus Christ, and you can <clears throat> go to your Bible study, where this is not the topic of the Bible study, but this is the introduction to it, okay? You go do the study and you'll find out that Jesus Christ is the embodiment of grace and truth. And so if you want to deal with the concept of grace, you need to understand the gift that God has given to us. The greatest gift that God has given to us is Jesus Christ, which then is the second gift under that is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so we have this thing which is a giftedness from God which is embodied in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. If you want to do a study of truth, then do a study of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, and you will be able to study truth. If you want to know truth, then do a study of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Well, I would encourage you to take the whole Bible, but that's a good place to start. What I would really encourage you not to do is end up being like Pilate. Pilate made a pivotal mistake, as far as I'm concerned, is that at one point in time, toward the very end of Christ's life, Pilate had the very Savior, Almighty God, of the world, the Lord, in his presence. Supposedly they were standing right next to each other. And as they were standing next to each other, instead of bowing his knee to that which he knew full well was the truth, what Pilate did was he played games, as far as I'm concerned. Because what he did was that he stood there and looked Jesus in the eye, somehow probably, and he says, but what is truth? I mean, the epitome. Of, could you imagine? How do you, did you, did Jesus, how do you even go about answering that question? It's like, hello. I know how we would answer it in today's, you know, today it would be, duh. Here I stand, Pilate. What are you thinking? Now, before we get too rough on Pilate, part of my challenge today is for us to seriously consider how many of us are also today, in our knowledge and understanding, the grace and truth Embodied in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is we are standing right next to that Savior. We're standing right next to that grace and to that truth. Might we not be those who are saying, but what is truth? And so this evening, in order to try to help us move away from ever saying that, but what is truth? Now, in the context of apologetics, I don't think it's a bad thing to ask or have people ask of you. But what is truth? Particularly in the 21st century. You step out in the 21st century and there are many people who don't even begin to understand truth. And they may be asking you, well, what is truth? Now, don't, don't chide them for not knowing what truth is. I'm talking to a group of Christians here this evening and as I'm talking to you, it was my hope that we, we're already a bit down the road, right? We already know this is truth. And so what we're going to do this evening as we spend some time together is consider what is grace, truth, and culture. 
And how can we contend for the truth of Christ in a 21st century culture that is pretty much so rejected truth? So, kind of, that's where we're going. So in order to kind of get us started, I thought it would be really clever if I could do the best I could to just offend you. I mean, why not, right? It's just, it's a fun thing. And so, <clears throat> here we go. If you want to talk about culture, and we're going to talk about culture, I would like to just introduce you to a bit. This is amazing. You guys must be either really tired from the previous workshop or you're kind of okay with this. You see the other group, they started getting really nervous. They started wondering, how long is he going to make us listen to this? Okay? You could just see it. You could sense it. A couple of them are, you know, they're moving around. They're getting ready to get up and walk out. And I'm going, no, no, don't leave. I'll shut the music off. And so I rushed over here and we, you know, we shut it down. Oh, I can't do that yet. All right, fine. I really enjoy it. I'll let it, I'll let it go. I'll let it go. Oh, there's violins. Or something. Okay. I know what I could have done. I actually, I could have started out suggesting that we're going to understand culture. And in order for us to understand culture, I could put on some good old country western. And then I thought, you know, if I, I say, go ahead. Uh, see, and, and then I gained, earlier this afternoon, I gained this entire half. I'm not suggesting you men now, but I gained this entire guy, this whole group came back again, and you guys are just applauding. That's really good, okay? But then I thought, you know, if I did play a little bit of country western, the next thing you know is we would all lose everything. You know? Because that's what it, you ever, you want to play country western, you know, like, like, either forward or backward, it doesn't matter. Either way you play it, you know? You get the gal, you lose the gal. You get the dog, you lose the dog. You get your beer, lose your beer. You get your truck, you lose your truck. Don't, don't you? Okay, come on. Okay, I mean, you can enjoy it, and I'm okay with that. But isn't it that? It's like, hmm. Or I thought maybe I could really just get myself thrown completely out of everything in regards to Christian and, you know, play some, you know, some real serious rock and roll. Be all right. See, some of us would be okay with that. It'd be so cool. Anyway, <clears throat> I, I chose not to do that. Right? No Rolling Stones. No. Yeah. See, sometimes we think that's what culture is. Culture or culture rated. See, it's somebody who is high culture, they listen to the right music. Yeah. I'm here to tell you that actually that's not what we're going to end up talking about. Oh, here's another one. I thought for a moment that I could help us out by suggesting something about culture. Now, I did tell you that I was ministered for eight years, nine, in Bethel, Missouri, right? Love those people. They love, it's like, maybe it's not completely, but it's close to the dear capital, right? <laughs> So this guy from Bethel dies, and, you know, St. Peter, there he is, Saint, he's standing in the line for St. Peter. Now, you know that I don't believe any of this, right? So don't get, okay, so, but here he is standing in line with St. Peter, and he's about three down, and St. Peter always liked to, you know, greet everybody, and, hey, welcome to heaven, glad to have you here, you know, that sort of, so that's St. Peter's job, he's doing that all the time, that's what he, you know, that's the gatekeeper for him, and so he sees this guy from Bethel down there a ways, and the next thing he knows is he's, he's going, ah, what am I going to say to this guy? He can't quite figure it out. And so the next thing he, see, he looks up and there's this woman from St. Louis. And there she is getting ready to come into heaven. And so she says, hey, um, uh, I understand that uh, you studied astronomy, that you were uh, like to the stars. Is that the right thing, right? And so you, 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 know, you looked into the stars and the heart of the universe. And, and he had this conversation with her that, you know, extraordinary IQ, brilliant. Brilliant woman. 
And he looks down the line and he goes, oh, that guy from Bethel, he's, not, he's yet in line. He's coming up this way. And so finally the guy from Bethel made it up there and Peter stuck his hand out and said, welcome guy from Bethel. And uh, Peter finally decided, oh, okay, I got it. Divine, you know, like, almost like it was divine revelation. Not, not really, just kidding. But he sticks out his hand to this guy from Bethel and he says, did you get your deer? <laughs> okay, maybe you don't get it. Um, you know, the, 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 if, if you're from Bethel, you get that, all right? Because that's part of that culture. And if I don't know how to talk that language in Bethel, there, I, I may need to kind of resort a few things. Could, now you're ready to actually throw me out, right? So just, just hang on and we'll switch gears real quick. I'm going to try to suggest today that as we are together, that there is a way for us to understand truth. There's a way for us to understand grace and the grace and truth which we find in Jesus the Christ. And we're going to put that up against what we often call culture, what ultimately today I'm going to call the world. And so I wanted to make fun of what we usually call culture so that we can really come to terms with the idea, biblically speaking, of what we might be needing to talk about and how these two actually juxtaposition one another and when they come together they hit pretty hard the idea of Jesus Christ and culture and so that's where we're going today and let's see if I can get us moving in that direction okay you have a handout the handout that you have understand what it is it's a compilation. It's not, it's not my lecture. I am not lecturing from it, verbatim, that sort of thing. It is the material that I use to put together to prepare for this. And I'm giving it to you so that you may have it. So that if you would like, you might use it as a tool or conversation starter sometime. It could help you start your fire. Um, I don't know how the different ways that you might want to use it. Please consider that it, uh, or look at it long enough to recognize that there are Bible verses in it. Recognize that there is a Bible study in the back of it. Also recognize that I'm giving you a bibliography. Okay? And so there is something there, is, there, is something there uh, to what you hold other than the things that I'm going to say. As a matter of fact, a few times I might actually be quoting something that you'll find there, but I'm not. This is not some memorized text for me, okay? And so I give it to you, I offer it to you as a helpful, helpful tool that you will be able to use if you choose as we walk through this. But let's begin then our walk together as we... There we go. Consider some of the ideas of culture. Not certain what was taking place in your life probably around the 70s. But for me personally, that's when I first learned how to read. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I went to college, and it was probably in college that I actually learned how to read. I don't know what system you used. I wasn't phonics. I was, you know, I was Dick and Jane. And so if it didn't have a picture, I got confused fast. And so when I went to college, I started reading. And when I started reading, I had a couple authors that I really, really deeply appreciated. And they were apologists. They were theologians that influenced the rest of my life. One of them was Francis Schaeffer. The other one was C.S. Lewis. Both men in their writing had a lot to do with my spiritual formation and how then I chose to function in my life in trying to honor Christ as a result of studying those men. It was Francis Schaeffer who comes along and he says, and then he wrote this entire book and there was also a movie series or some videos and stuff that likened to that uh, that he put together and um, the book was what was impressive to me and many of his books I, I read I studied I worked through them I worked through them with other college students the question that he tried to answer ultimately was what is it oh yeah it's how should we how should we then live how we ought to live. If the things of the Word of God are true, then how ought we to live? Okay? And what he would come down to over and over again is that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was in the Scriptures. 
Over and over again, he'd say that the ideas and the values that are shared in the scriptures are worth our standing on. They make for a foundation for the rest of our lives. He helped me understand that. And then a number of years after that, it was Charles Coulson. And Charles Coulson comes along and sort of takes some of Francis Schaeffer's idea. You know, you remember Charles Coulson, don't you? I yeah. sometimes say something like that, and the next thing you know is I, if I'm talking to college students, I have to do a whole thing of history. But I, I think I'm okay here. And uh, so in his Nixon years, the man did some things that were not so good that landed him in prison, right? Yeah. But while he was in prison, he came to know Jesus. And while he was in prison, he committed his life to the ministry of Christ. And as a result of that, we have the prison fellowship ministry. As a result of that, he started writing. And one of the books that he wrote was kind of a redo, asking the same questions that Francis Schaeffer was asking about 50 years earlier or so. Then Charles Colson comes along and he asks some similar questions again. And his saying is, if the things that we're seeing in our culture are true, if the things of Christ are true, then how is it that we today are to live out our lives? So then he says, how shall we now live? Or how now shall we live? Now, interestingly enough, when Francis Schaeffer was in Europe and when Colson was looking at trying to write his books, a young lady found herself in both of those two men's lives. And her name is Nancy Piercy. Today, a good book to have that would help us once again. She's done the same thing. She has resorted the same questions, and now she's saying it's called Finding the Truth, Nancy Piercy. She takes the ideas and concepts philosophically that are laid out by Francis Schaeffer. Actually, she was ghostwriter for a bit for Coulson. And so when Colson starts sounding like Schaefer, the connect that you should make is not that those men spent a lot of time together, <laughs> but there was a young lady that came to Christ because she went over as an atheist, but under the ministry and with Edith and Francis Schaefer, she came to know Jesus, and so then she put her writing skills together, and it was a ghostwriter for Charles Colson. So then when she graduates from, universe, uh, from seminary, in St. Louis, she ends up writing, she's written about three or four books, but Finding the Truth is where she takes these concepts and these ideas and she writes then what? Her own book trying to answer the 21st century question, how shall we live? How is it that we ought to come to terms with the world in which we're living today? Oh. Did I tell you this isn't a new, this isn't some new idea? This isn't just the newest thing off the block? No, no, no. It's been around for a very long time. As a matter of fact, just getting ready for this afternoon's uh, workshop, I stopped by in the professor's study, and uh, we were visiting a little, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready to do this workshop. And he said, oh, really? What's it about? I told him what it's about. And he said, oh, we, we ended up getting in a conversation. The conversation that we had ended up being this. We both ended up agreeing. So when there are two or three who agree, uh-huh, we're awful close. But let's see what you think. He said, do you know the 21st century is closer to being like the 1st century than any century between the 21st and the 1st century? Think about that for a while. It won't take very long, and I think you're going to agree. The difficulties, the complications, the things that were going on in the first century when Jesus showed up, many of those things are actually being repeated in our globalized world today. You just do me a favor and think a little bit beyond the United States of America. And so if you start thinking in that context, it won't take you very long, and you're going to go, wow. The world is asking almost the same questions that they were asking and seeking in the first century. We have millions of pilots today. There's not just one of them. There are many. And they're seeking the truth. Just in case you don't want to accept that one, this is uh, taken from a page right out of the um, Berlin uh, paper. 
back at the time of, yeah, Wilhelm Kaiser. For those of you who won't quite remember that, you know, that was pre-World War I. And so you had Wilhelm Kaiser trying to keep Germany together. He's trying to do everything he can to influence the people of Germany to remain good German people, Wilhelm Kaiser. And the problem he was having is that Rome, the Pope, was coming in and trying to take over major sections of Germany. Okay, you go study the science, you go study the history and kind of sort through that. But that's what was going on. Do you know what that is? That is, got it, we're okay. That is a culture shock. That was a culture war. You had the government and you had the church and they were warring against one another and the common people knew about it. That's why you find it in a newspaper. It was no secret. It was taking place all over. So then we come back and we say, then what is culture? Let me remind us of what culture is not. Culture is not this high brownness that we often make it out to be. All right, I understand it. Okay, I got my bow tie. Okay. Now, Stephen's got himself one. So, Stephen and I, we know how to dress for these occasions. Now, for the rest of you, well, all right. You know I'm kidding, right? Okay. Um, it's not the right art. Culture is not the right art, the right food, the right status, the right... Being cultured at one point in time, that's what we thought about. We're not talking about that today. What we're talking about today is essentially... The very, the very fiber that makes you who you are and how we can know that. And we know that from the outside in and from the inside out. You ready? I thought it would be clever if I handed everybody an onion. <laughs> or maybe better than that, just hand every other person an onion and then have somebody take a knife and just slice it right down through the middle. Okay? I don't know if you like onions or not, but I like onions. And the last thing I want to do when I sit down to eat my onion is eat the outside of the onion, right? I mean, does anyone do... You don't eat the skin of an onion, right? You can eat the skin of an apple, but you don't eat the skin of an onion. You just don't do that. But at the heart of the onion, have you ever done that? I've done that. I, you know, I, I could peel some of that onion away and get right down to the part that says, mmm, I am onion. And you go, mmm, that's not bad. Oh, now, all of a sudden you're going, like my college students, what, what happened to this guy? Did he get, you know, smell dinner or something? Or what, what happened to him? Well, this is what happened to me. You ready? Sometimes, and this has been around for a very long time, the French came up with it, I think, first, and then the man's name was Temiria, and uh, he wrote about social culture, and he wrote about the various types of cultures, <clears throat> and as they began to try to identify various different types of cultures, they decided that this is the best way to understand culture. The best way to understand culture first is, what do we look like on the outside? In other words, our behavior and our artif artifacts. What do we do? What do we make? Then you step in a ways and you end up coming to terms with what are our emotions? What do we feel? And how do we feel? Oh, stop. I want you to stop because right now in the 21st century, right here is where most people live. It's about how we feel. We don't even really think too much about what we have on. But it's about how I feel. And if I feel like it, then we're going to do it. And if I get with a group of people, four or five of us, that agree that we all feel the same way about it, then we're going to start a whole movement. And the next thing you know is we're going we're to do a community. We're going to take over the world because this is how I feel. If you take that type of person and probe just a little bit, they have no idea why they feel the way they feel. They just feel it. That 21st century culture. We are motivated by how we feel. Sit down and have a conversation with somebody someday. And by the time you get finished, by the time you're finished, logically working through something with them and get down to the truth, the truth concerning Christ, I've done this more than once in my life. Sharing Christ with somebody, 
They're convinced. They're saying, yep, this makes sense. They catch it here. But then they go, so what? I said, how can you do that? I don't know. It just doesn't feel right to me. So we have to, we have to ask, how is it that we have so many people that when it comes to their emotions, that they're ruled primarily by their emotion? Well, because we're lacking value and belief. We're lacking value and belief in our current culture. We're lacking value and belief in our current culture primarily because we're confused about what is or is not real. Okay? Since we're confused about what is or is not real and we skip right over values, then the only thing that I have is maybe the coat that I have on, but then next to that is my sleeve and my emotions, and this is where everything works. I believe this to be a true story, and this is what I was told. When Roy Weiss, campus minister, first came to university, he was barely set up his desk. He would barely set up his desk, barely set up his office. This young student comes walking in off the street and says, I want to know about this Jesus, this Christ, that you as a Christian campus house are going to be talking about. So can you tell me about that? I want to know why. I want to know why I need to follow what you're going to say. Can you tell me about that? Now, it's my understanding that he said, yes, but could you give me a week? Okay, I don't, that's... The man that I knew would have never been able, he, would have, he, he, he wouldn't have needed the week. He said, hey, sit down, I'm going to, you know, sit down, I'm going to have a talk with you right now. But th that's the story. So a week went by, student comes back, sits down, across the desk from him now, and says, well, do you have an answer? And Roy Weiss said, yes, I do. He said, there are these three things. And he said this, God is real. The Bible is true. And Jesus Christ is alive. Amen. And he said, you can put your life on that. He said, I put my life on it. Now that's not changed, people. We just, sometimes, I think, even as Christians, are a little rattled about what is real. So I would encourage us to possibly come back to terms with that, of what really is real. And even as Christians, stop running off our emotions. Spend some time at that core. Okay? Now, yeah, just for the fun of it, I thought it would be interesting to kind of run through a Bible study. Oh, I've helped you out a lot. And that is, we don't have to look up all these verses. And kind of like, you know, your favorite preacher who says, he's kind of finished at this point and says, now that was the introduction. I only have four more passages to look at. I, I know how we all feel about that, okay? Yeah, I've been on both ends of that. Um, so what I'm going to do is to summarize a number of scriptures that you have right there in front of you that's already been written out for you, that if this was a workshop where we would maybe even now, if, I would, if we had the time, I'd break this up and I would ask you, I'd, I'd just break it up and each one of you would take a section and read through these scriptures and then come back and say, what did you learn from that? And then we would go on. And so you have them there. They're right in front of you. Let's allow me then to just kind of run through this quickly. Okay? Now, 
if I've not convinced you yet, I believe in my personal heart of hearts that the Word of God is the place that each one of us ought to start and finish our lives. Okay? And so my quickly going over this shouldn't bring you to question whether or not I believe that truth. Okay? But because of time, I'm going to be quick. Okay? So, what does the Bible really say? Christ and the culture. The Bible, what the Bible really says about Christ and the culture, Michael Curtis' paraphrase of what we have in front of us, <laughs> Jesus, when he's praying to the Father about his disciples, he said, you've given to me, Father, you've given them to me, and they're following me. And so it ought not surprise us that they are not in the world, they are out of the world, and the world hates them. Now, some of you are going to say, now, wait a minute, you just made a big jump from culture to the world. Now, I'm not, I don't think I'm the one making that big jump, actually. I think when, what we have done is we've softened the words of the world and how we should see the world by calling it culture. And so then we say that some cultures are better than other cultures than simply recognizing that no matter what words you want to use to describe culture, the Greek seems to have a couple of them. One of them is cosmos, which is the world and everything of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, that's one, okay? That's one of the words that's used. Another one is more like the word for eon, and that is an age. And oftentimes that word is translated from that Greek word back into the English, or into the English simply as the world. And so there's the concept of there's this age that we're living in, and there's also the concept of the entire, entire world and everything in the world and everything of the world. Now, you need, to, you need to kind of walk through this with me, or we're, we, may not, we may not get it, and we may not get there. Because next, if you go reading through 1 John, you're going to find out that there are only two. There are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of light, there's the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of Satan. Now, the next thing that's hard to say in the world in which we're living is we're in one or the other. <laughs> but we are. And as Christians, oftentimes we try to kind of walk between both of them. And so for this evening, what I am setting before us according to the scripture is that the one that rules this world is the enemy. Okay? Satan. The devil. And all you have to do is do a really quick study of 1 John, and that's where you're going to find that. And the scriptures are set there, and I've got them set out for you in English. Okay? So then all of a sudden, what are we to be? We as Christians are set up to be different than the world. Now, I'm, I'm, the, the idea is that we have to be in the world, but not of the world. And that makes us different than the world. Now, we have to, once again, and there's, there's uh, four or five, three. So I have three scriptures there that say, this is, this is what makes us different. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Apostle Paul comes along and says, I beg you, I beseech you. To give yourself as a living sacrifice. What he's doing here is calling us out of the world of darkness into the world of light. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. It's not up there. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. He comes along and he says what there? He says, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. The life I now live is not my life. Once again, what is that? It's a juxtaposition. It's set apart. And so as Christians, we have to be here. I got that part. I understand it. Oh, let's take a look at John 18, 36, Philippians 3, 20. <laughs> What's that talking about? What that's talking about is I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. And guess what? I'm, some, I'm, I'm heading someplace else. My citizenry, my citizenship is not 
Write this down for me, although I carry a passport in the United States of America, and I'm very pleased to be able to do that, and I'm very thankful for that, because that allows me to go any place in the world and say, hey, here it is, this is my passport, and that gives me passage. I got that, okay? But that is simply my passport, and I happen to live here, but this is not my citizenry. My citizenship is in heaven. And oh, that if more of us could really get that in our head. George Eldon Ladd, a number of years ago, when I was studying eschatology, he said that it's, it's like, it's yes, but not yet. It's yes, but not yet. <clears throat> I love the way he did that. It's, it, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's the present, but oh, no, wait a minute, it's the future. And it's the, we're right here now in the future, but yet it's something else. You, I mean, it's, oh, you, did I just say we're right here yet now in the future? Didn't it, it kind of gets confusing, doesn't it? Sure it does. Because it's not of this world, and it's not going to make any sense to anybody how I am of another world, but yet I'm here. Oh, it's almost like, doo -doo 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 -doo. the guy's gone crazy, and he's talking about aliens. No, I'm not. I'm talking about who and what we are in the kingdom of God. And that is, I am here, but it's coming. The kingdom is here, but it's coming. It's yes, but not yet. And that makes us now in the kingdom. It's not simply something I keep on, oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, I'm looking forward to it. No, it's here and it's right now, and we need to live in it. We're in a world, but my citizenship is heaven. Oh, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Remember that one? Oh, that was real culture for you, yeah. I could do that again. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. No, you, you remember singing it, don't you? All kinds of those mm, gospel songs we sing, <clears throat> they're true. I'm here. We're here. But this isn't it. Jesus clearly says that we're to be the salt and the light of a horrible world of a hard world. And that's who we are to be as Christians. And if that's who we're really supposed to be as Christians, then we are to be imitators of Christ. We are to be imitators of Christ. We are to be the followers of Christ. Apostle Paul said, you follow me as I follow Jesus. If you'd read Paul carefully, he would say, when I, stop, when I stop following Jesus, you stop following me. And what we should be doing today is you follow me as I follow Christ. Because we are Christ's followers. And this is how I live. This is why I live. Because we are following Christ. In the 1990s, I served a church in Southeast Christian Church in Denver, Colorado. Not the southeast, it's southeast, it's the other way. This is southeast, it's, you know, Denver, Colorado. In Southeast Christian Church, you had the opportunity to serve this, you know, up and growing church. Today, it's a mega church. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about, about that church, okay? So we were sitting around in the 90s, and we thought, you know, the cl cleverest thing we could do is, you know, I mean, if Gene Weiss had a three-point thing, why don't we have a three-point thing? We didn't say that. <laughs> But I guess everybody was coming up with three points of why they were doing what they were doing. And so all the churches were coming up with clever mottos. And so we came up with ours. You want to hear ours? This is ours. Okay. We were going to be biblically sound. We were going to be Christ-centered. And we were going to be culturally relevant. Doesn't that sound great? You know what happens when you're culturally relevant? We start becoming more like the culture than we do Christ. For the sake of the culture. And so if I had anything to do with that, I'd like to go back and erase number three. Okay? Periodically in class, when I'm talking to a group of, you know, 18 to 25-year-olds, I, I, I take a moment, this may be one of those moments, I'm just say, hey, I've got something to say to you people. And that is, I'm sorry. Some of us made mistakes. This is one of the mistakes we made. Because all of a sudden we became so relevant 
that people couldn't see the difference between us Amen. and Christ and the culture. We got all confused. So we had, to, we had to write that ship. And the church did. And we did a wonderful thing beyond that. But there was a period of time there where we were going, ooh, what are we bringing people to? Nah, got to think about it. So how do we do that? Well, it was Richard Nabor, and this you can pick up on your own. You just kind of walk through it. But some 60 years ago, Richard Nabor wrote this book called Christ and Culture. And in it, he suggests that there are various ways in which we as Christians have to deal with the idea of our culture. And some of those things run something like this, okay? Christ is against the culture. And maybe after today, you're going to walk out here and say, wow, he just, didn't he say that Christ was against the culture? Mm. Another thing that he might say is that Christ is of, it's Christ of culture. Christ must become like the Lord of the culture type thing. Uh, another one he might say is that Christ is above culture. And you just kind of have to live with it. Whatever you say, it's a paradox. And some suggest that what Niebuhr was really writing about was that Christ was supposed to be the transformer of culture. Okay? Now that sounds like a really wonderful idea. Kind of like being culturally relevant. No, 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 follow me for a moment, okay? What happens when we suggest that what becomes most important for us is church? I'm, I'm doing a little switch on you here, but hold on to it, okay? What happens when we as church start saying that part of our responsibility is to transform culture, we lose sight of Christ's purpose. Christ's purpose was not to transform culture. Christ's purpose was to transform lives. Okay? Now, we didn't, you didn't sit here for 45 minutes to then tell me that you're not getting this. So I just want to make sure that you kind of walk out of here getting it. So I'm going to say it again. Okay? Jesus and the disciples did not go out with the goal of changing their culture. As soon as we start talking about changing the culture, of changing the world, that power is in that. And when we start talking about that, someone has to mandate that power. And as soon as somebody starts mandating that power, you end up with, I'm not speaking badly about this, it's just what happened. You end up with Constantine in about 312 to 375. Then we, all of a sudden, one day, all of Rome woke up and what? They were all Christians. We're Christians. Why? We won the war. We're Christians. No one knew what it was to be a Christian. And we yet suffer from it today because of that. And all of a sudden then you had to mandate the power to keep the citizenry in its proper place. So you start making all kinds of things up about what it means to be a Christian. Go back and read your history. You've got to come to terms with that. So the culture changed? Yeah, I don't know for sure. But I do know this. Christ did not come to change a culture. He did not come to change a world. Uh, 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 just a minute. What he did is he came to save our soul. And so this is where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a place. We find ourselves in a place. That we just have to deal with it. I'm a light. I'm a light. It's my responsibility to be the light. It's not my responsibility to make all of my neighbors light their light. That they don't even have. You hear me? So then when they say, hey, I want a part of that light, then we can talk to them about Jesus. I'm the salt. We're salt. Salt preserves. Salt saves. And that's what we're going to do. 
but I'm going to save a culture? We could argue that we could save, the, save a culture, change the world, one soul at a time. We could maybe do that. Maybe that would work. But be careful. Our goal is to be the light. To be the part of the kingdom of light. For those who are in the kingdom of darkness, who need to be taken from the darkness and placed in the kingdom of light. And that's done through Jesus. You ready? Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. <clears throat> a while ago we were there. Go back there just for a moment with me. You all got it memorized. I beseech you. I beg you. You know, unfortunately, whoever numbered all this stuff, I, I think kind of did us a disservice because we, 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 we stop with 1136. And then we never, or we start with 12, you know, 12, 1 and 2, just like we did today. Hey, would you turn with me to, to you know, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2? Oh, yeah, we, are, we got that memorized. We know what that is. We know what that is, but we know what it is outside of its context. Take a moment with me here and we'll be out. Let me put it in its context. Romans chapter 1, beginning of all things theological. Romans chapter 2 and 3 and 4, Apostle Paul continues to just, he builds this extraordinary grandeur of the theology of Almighty God. And so when you look out across Romans, okay, and if you've never studied Romans, then please, 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 someday pick it up and look at it. But take it all in, okay? It's like when I remember when I first, I was a little tiny kid out in Nebraska, okay? I never knew what a mountain was. And my parents took me out to Colorado. And you come around this one place out there, I think someplace by Fort Morgan. But you come around out there someplace, you turn this corner on Old Highway 30 or whatever it was. You come around and turn that corner. All of a sudden, boom! It's like, you got mountains! And then there's little tiny things. It's like, what are they? But you got them. I remember the first time that I went backpacking in those mountains. And you walk around and you walk around all day long. And you come around a particular place in the backside of this mountain. You come around a particular place. And all of a sudden, you got all of them right out there in front of you. You got that? That's Romans. That's Romans, theologically speaking. Everything there is to know of God, you've got it. It's right there. It's right there. You ready? And then Paul comes along in 1136 and he says this, For from him, Christ. For from Christ and through him and to him are all things to God be the glory. And then he asks the question. And it makes sense there. If all the rest of this is true, the only reasonable, take a look at the scripture, that's what's the only reasonable, the only logical thing to do is to give yourself. And out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Gentlemen, we are the light of the world that so desperately needs the light. So, what do you do with this? Oh, I have an idea. Yeah, go light up your world. Uh-huh, just recognize that it's about winning others to Christ. God gave his son for it. And might we be willing to give our very lives for it. Thank you.